Good morning. Hope that you're doing well this morning. Uh, I just want to tell you this morning that uh, I hope this morning that you have felt welcome and loved. And uh, this morning, if it's your first time here, or maybe it's your first time in a long time, we want you to know that we love you and that we are just so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, and so today, uh, we're going to talk about something that that we like to think about this time of year, but it's a little bit a little bit harder to talk about, and then it's a little bit even harder to practice. And what I want us to talk about today is the idea of generosity. So last last week we talked about hospitality, and today I want to talk about generosity. And so before we go any farther, I want to let you know that um, we're not planning on like passing the plot again after I get done with this message. Uh, we're not planning on, I'm not trying to leverage you at this time of the year so that I get like a Christmas bonus or anything like that. Uh, the reason that I'm talking about generosity this morning is not because I want something from you. It's because I want something for you. Amen. And uh, here's what I mean by that. I believe that uh, everybody in this room, we would like to have more joy, right? It, it, nobody thinks, man, I'd like to be more miserable. I just, my life is too good, I, I enjoy things too much, I, I just wish I was more miserable. Now we all want more joy, and here's what I believe this morning. I believe that generosity is connected to joy. And he, he, Here's how I know that. I have never met a generous person that wasn't joyful. And I've never met a joyful person who wasn't generous. And so I believe that the two are connected uh, in a way that I believe they're inseparable. So generosity and joy are connected. And so this morning I want us to look at a passage of Scripture um, in 1 Timothy 6. And so if you have your Bible, you can start turning there. If you have a mobile device with a, a Bible on it. If you don't have your Bible this morning, there's a Bible in front of you. And you are open to, welcome to open this up uh, and look at it. And if you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to take that one home with you. And so that'll be our gift to you. And uh, I want to give you a little background about 1 Timothy 6 before we dive into it. Um, Timothy, the book of Timothy was actually a letter. It wasn't really a book, and it was written by the Apostle Paul, but before... Uh, Apostle Paul was the Apostle Paul. He was a guy named Saul. And Saul was this really religious guy and he hated Christians. And so maybe you're here this morning and you don't like Christians. That's okay because uh, the guy that wrote half of our New Testament, he didn't like Christians either. And so uh, that changes. And uh, the Saul of Tarsus, he hates Christians. In fact, he hates Christians so much that he kills Christians for a living. And so that's what... He was doing one day, he was on his way uh, to kill some Christians, and he actually encounters the resurrected Lord. He encounters Jesus, he's knocked off his horse, he's blinded, and he eventually puts his faith in Christ and becomes a preacher. And he goes around and he's the um, starting all of these new churches, and he along the way he meets this young guy named Timothy. And Timothy has grown up in a Christian home, and Paul kind of takes him under his wing. And one day they travel to a city called Ephesus, uh, and there's a church there, about 20,000 people. Timothy's about 19 years old, and Paul says, Hey, Timothy, I'm leaving you to lead this church of about 20,000. And so he leaves Timothy in charge of this church, and he goes on. And while he is in prison, he writes to young Timothy to give him some instruction about how to handle uh, this huge church. And in the letter, uh, towards the end of the letter, this is what Paul says uh, to Timothy. Last words, uh, some of the last words in the book. He says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them... 
not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on uncertain, uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we come to you this morning and we love you so much, God, but we realize that you love us more. God, as we take a look at generosity this morning, God, I pray that you would give us generous and glad hearts. God, I pray that this morning we could be moved by your word, God, and Lord, that you would touch us, touch our hearts in a way that you would change the way we think and the way that we live. God, uh, pray for your anointing on me this morning, that I could speak your words with clarity and with love. Lord, we love you this morning, and we thank you, thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Paul says to Timothy, as for the rich, and as he says, as for the rich, we all take a big sigh of relief because we're not rich, right? You know, that's not me, I'm not rich. And have we got any rich people in the house? No, we don't. None of us see ourselves as rich, right? Right? Do you see yourself as rich? You always look at, at the person. Uh, maybe you've got a family member who's rich and they can get whatever they want. Or maybe you have a, like an uncle who's rich and, and you know they have all kinds of money. Maybe you have a neighbor and they just bought the new bass boat and so they must be rich. Um, we all have people, maybe it's somebody on TV and you see them and they're like driving a Lexus or they're driving a Ferrari and you say, well, they must be rich. But none of us see ourselves as rich, right? So if we were reading this passage on our own when it said, as for the rich, we might just glaze over that and say, Whew, I'm glad that doesn't apply to me because... I know some rich people, but I'm not a rich person. I'm not a rich person. And so, this morning, what I want you to realize is that for every person that you're looking up to and saying, that person's rich, that person has money, there's just as many people looking up at you and saying, that person's rich, that person has money. I want to give you a couple statistics this morning so that you can see that this morning you really are rich. You may not feel rich, but you are rich. And so this morning in the world, uh, one out of two kids is living in poverty. Not just poverty, but extreme poverty. One out of two kids. That means half of the population of the world, those kids, they don't have adequate food. Water or shelter. So one out of two kids in the world today are in extreme poverty. Half of the world's population, 50% of the world's population, lives on less than $2.50 a day. I can't drive my truck to work for $2.50, much less live all day on it. Most of us, if I laid $2.50 in the floor right there, you wouldn't even stop to pick it up. And 50% of the world's population lives on that. That means this morning, if you have more than $2.50 to your name, you are richer than 50% of the world's population. You are in the top 50% automatically, and most of us could find that much change in our couch. If you're a family of four this morning, it means there's two adults and there's two kids in your house, and you have a yearly income.
income of $15,000. That's minimum wage, one person working at minimum wage 40 hours a week. You are in the richest 25% of the world's population. The richest 25%. And your annual income is four times that of the global average. That means you are four times as rich as most people in the world. But if you have an annual income that is $45,000 a year, you're in the richest 90%. You're, that means you, that you're richer than 90% of the world's population. You're in the top 10% if, you make, if your household makes $45,000 a year. And your average income is 12 times. 12 times that of most, person, most people in the world. And so while me and you, we're looking at those people who maybe make $150,000, $250,000 a year, and we're saying those people are rich. Those people have it made. Those people have it all together. The rest of the world is looking at you and I the same way that we look at those people. They're saying those people, those people at Bomb Baptist Church, they are loaded. They are rich. And you and I, we don't even realize it. We don't even realize that we're rich. Chances are that most of us in this house this morning, we don't worry about how we will pay for our next meal. And if you're worried about what you're going to buy your kids for Christmas, you're probably richer than 90% of the world's population. What I'm not trying to do this morning, I'm not trying to make you feel terrible. That's, I'm not setting up a guilt trap this morning. Here's what I want. I want us to realize how blessed we are, how much we've been entrusted with, because give, God's give us the things we have for a reason. He's put us where we are for a reason. You shouldn't feel guilty about being born in the United States. You should f feel privileged that you have the opportunity to make such a big difference in the world. To m who much has been given, much is expected. And for everybody in this house this morning, much has been given to you. Amen. And so here's what I want us to realize. We have been given so much. There's no reason that we can't be generous. And so Paul would say, as for the rich in this present age, he's talking to me and you. You may not feel rich. You may not think you're rich at the end of the month. You may feel like you're really not rich, but you're rich. And so as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, which means tell them not to feel like they're better than other people just because they have money. And then he says, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. And so what Paul is doing here, he's getting down to brass tacks because Paul realizes that generosity is not about uh, dollar signs and cent signs. It's about hope. And where you have your hope affects whether or not you will be generous. So here's what I mean. Many of us, we find stability and security in our objects, in the money we have. And so if at the end of the month all you have is $20, you feel less secure than if you have $2,000 left over, right? You, you feel secure with some money in the bank. But if your hope is set on that money, if you find your security in riches, you have placed that hope in the wrong place. There's nothing wrong with wealth. God gives us those things. It's no, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. As long as those nice things don't have you. 
And so what happens to me and you so many times is we, we find our identity in what we have. We find our identity in the money that we have. And that's what we can't find our identity there. We can't find our security in how much money we have left in the bank. Our identity and our security has to come from God. And here's why. Money's not a good place to put your faith. Many of you uh, lost thousands of dollars in 2008 because of the uncertainty of riches. Money's here today and it's gone tomorrow. The fact of the matter is that everything you own will be somebody else's one day. You cannot put your faith in money. And so generosity is not an issue of how much money you have or how much money you don't have. It's an issue of where you've placed your hope. Because if your hope is in riches, you'll think thoughts like, well, I, I want to give to the church, I want to contribute to what's going on there, but what if I don't have enough money? What if at the end of the month I, I just can't make ends meet? I want to contribute to the Lottie Moon, or I want to give to that family down the street. I feel like God's leading me to do those things, but what if? What if I don't have enough? What if I can't do it? What if, if you have those thoughts, and we all do, it means that you may have some misplaced hope. Your hope may be in the money you have and not in the one who's given you the money. Because here's the deal, everything you own, all the money in your bank and the car that you drove here and the house that you slept in last night, it's all God's. And He's given it to you on loan. And sure, you went out and you worked at your job, but God gave you the strength to work at that job. He gave you the opportunities that you've had. He gave you the wisdom that you needed to make those deals, to make that money. And so everything that we own and everything that we have, it's already God's. Will we trust God with what's already His? Many of us, we put our hope in our limited supply. How many people in this house today have a limited supply of money? <laughs> it, it, we all have a limited supply, right? If not, you're going to buy my dinner today. But we all have a limited supply, and it's easy for us to put our faith in our limited supply. But when we can let go of what God's given us, when we're able to live with open hands, realizing that everything we have was God's, and that if He asks us to give it up, it's already His. When we, can, when we can get that in our heads and when we can live our lives that, we have access to unlimited supply of heaven. Man, God is not short on change. Amen. He is, is not poor. God is not withholding. God wants to bless you. But if God's pouring down blessings and all you can do is hold on to your limited supply, you'll never be able to receive them. Yeah. We'll live and we'll just scrape by. And this morning I'm not talking about a prosperity message where if you give uh, one, God will send back ten. But I am saying this morning that I have never seen somebody who stepped out in faith to give and be generous look back and say, Man, God didn't take care of me. God let me down. God didn't come through. Every single time that God in my personal life, that He's led me to give big, crazy amounts, and what's big and crazy to me may not be the same for you, but He's always made it possible. He's always provided for my needs. Everything I need, He provides. And so I don't want to trust in the money that I have or the money that I'm earning or the money that's coming next week. I want to put my faith in a God who can give me whatever I need. And so what I want for me and what I want for you is for us to live lives with open hands, realizing that if somebody else needs it, we can give it. And if we need it, God can give it. 
Do you realize this morning that if you will be obedient to God, and you will be generous when God leads you to be generous. And this morning I'm not just talking about giving to the church, I'm talking about uh, the family down the road. You can be someone else's miracle. That family down there, oh, they may be praying for food. They may be praying for their electric bill to be paid. And if you will listen to God and you will be obedient, if you will be generous with what God's given you, you may just be the answer to someone else's prayer. God wants to use you and your generosity this morning. And so generosity asks this question. Will you trust God with your money? Will you trust God with your money? It's easy for us sometimes, and uh, I'll just be real here, it's easy for us to, to trust God with our salvation. It's easy to trust God with our souls. But sometimes it's hard to trust God with our money. It is. And so, this morning, generosity is about trust. Will you trust God? And so, this morning, I want you to realize that true generosity is not spur of the moment. Generosity is not when you feel really guilty that you give some money or when... um, when somebody gets up here and plays a video with uh, like starving kids in it, we all want to give money when that happens. Okay, So I'm not talking about guilt or somebody uh, twisting your arm to, for you to give. What I'm talking about is intentional giving. Where you plan and you pray about how to give. That's what I want for us. That's what I want in our hearts to desire to give so much that we plan and pray about what we're going to give. And so, this morning, I, I never want our giving to c- come because we feel guilty or because we feel obligated. If you feel guilty or obligated, then please don't give to this church. Okay, you can go give somewhere else, but don't give to this church because... What we want is giving generosity that comes from a deep love for Christ and a love for others. And a desire to see those others come to Christ. And so before you give, I I ask that you would always bathe your gift in prayer and ask God exactly what you want, what He wants you to do. We give because we want to make a difference in the lives of others. We give because God's given so much to us. And when we give, when we decide when that we're going to pray and plan about what we're going to give, when we decide that we are going to have a generous heart, we experience joy beyond measure. Jesus said it this way, It's more blessed to give than to receive. That word blessed means happy. It means that you will find more joy when you give than when you receive. And so if you want to experience joy, then you have to let go of your stingy and selfish financial habits. You have to decide to be generous. Because we realize that God has given us everything we have, and because we realize that everything we own is already God's, when we decide to be selfish and stingy, when we refuse to be generous, we're not using what's God's the way He would use it. We are mismanaging the money that God's given us. We are misrepresenting who God is when we are selfish. Because here's the deal. God is a generous God. 
He is so generous. He loves to give us the things that, that we need. He loves to provide for our needs just like you love to provide for your kids. He loves to provide for you. And he's seen that we were spiritually bankrupt. He's seen that, that we had debt that we couldn't pay. But it was far more uh, important than a debt on a car. It was a spiritual debt. And we were spiritually bankrupt. We didn't have anything to offer. We didn't have anything to give. We couldn't get to God. We had no way to be good enough to be connected to a perfect God. There was a gap between the best we could do and what it took to get to God. Couldn't bridge the gap on our own. But God gave us the most valuable thing, the most valuable gift that could have ever been given. His Son. His only Son. Perfect in every way. And He bridged the gap between us and God. And now it's not a matter of whether we follow rules well or not. It's a matter of will we believe. And walk across the bridge of faith to be in, early, be in relationship with God. God has given us such an amazing gift. We should be generous with other, others. That generosity of God that He's given us so much compels us to live open-handed, and generous lives. This morning I want to pray for us. And uh, let's go ahead and pray. God, we uh, love you this morning. And we thank you for everything that you've done for us. God, we thank you for Jesus and the cross. Lord, we thank you that you have given us such a model of generosity in the gospel message. God, we realize that you have been so good to us, that you've given us so much. God, I pray that you would change our hearts so that we could be generous. God, so that we could be given and that we could show people who you are by the way that we love them and by the way that we give to them. Lord, you are so amazing. We love you this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, this altar is going to be open, and if you need to pray about something, if you need to talk to somebody about giving your life to Jesus, that would be awesome, the best decision that you've ever made. And so I'd love to talk to you about that. If you uh, have something else you need to pray about, I'd love to pray with you about it. But uh, this altar is going to be open, and uh, it's open for everybody.